ripple effect. For example, in today's world, monocultured people, monos, have a historical view of the world that is largely monoculturally determined. For example, the Japanese have a victim mentality regarding the use of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's understandable, but not the whole picture. Due to the Japanese government's reluctance to teach its peoples the realities of the horrors it committed in Asia in the Second World War, the Japanese people are largely ignorant of what their parents and grandparents did during that time. When Westerners go to the Hiroshima Museum, they may be bombarded by Japanese high school children doing English language and historical projects by surveying the Westerners with questions such as, do you feel guilty about dropping the bomb? It becomes clear that there are strong intercultural differences in perception about the use of the bomb. I remember my reply to one such high school student who thrust an answer sheet at me. We did it to stop the war. A land invasion of Japan by US forces would have killed far more Japs than the bombs. You Japs had murdered 30 million Asians in the 1930s and 40s. Do you feel guilty about that? Do you even know about it? A similar argument can be made about the worst holocaust in history, that is, in the so-called land of liberty and the land of the free, that is, in the US, who killed off an estimated 90-90 million natives, redskins. A uh, question, I question that 90, it just seems too, too large, but I need to look into it more carefully. Uh, continuing that living, that figure of 90 million I picked up from the native American Museum in Washington DC so maybe it's correct I assume they uh, they did their homework they did their research to get to come to this figure you know, comprised from you know, PhD professor researchers you know competent people and that it's not just a silly exaggeration but it's it seems so large I, f I find that hard to imagine I mean th these people were hunter-gatherers right 90 million most of them. Most Americans don't know about such things because understandably the US government is not keen to broadcast such things. Similarly, the white population in the US is not too keen to do the same either. The reality of what happened goes so against the grain of what Americans are taught, brainwashed, question mark, to believe, that is, that they are a modern, humane, democratic nation, not the planet's greatest holocausters. So, the global media will be capable of presenting the views of all sides to everyone. By definition, glow media is truly global, in a global language, presenting the world's knowledge, especially historical and political knowledge, for the world's citizens, globans, to absorb. This greater knowledge will make everyone better informed about what really happened in the past, and hence overcome traditional monocultured biases in the historical interpretation. The Japanese will learn more about what they did in World War II, as taught them by such countries as China, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, etc. The Americans will learn about their killing off of the American natives, as, as taught them by the ancestors, no, the descendants of those natives. The British people can learn about uh, what their government did to the Chinese when it went to war with China over Britain's demand to continue selling opium to the Chinese masses, despite the huge drug addiction problem this awful trade was causing. These opium wars result in the creation of Hong Kong, which was a booty town given to the British by the Chinese, so that the British government could continue to be a drug pusher by modern standards. The Australian white settlers killed off literally all Tasmanian Aborigines. I remember seeing the skeleton of the last Tasmanian Aborigine, a woman, in the Melbourne Museum when I was a child. Obviously, there are many examples one could mention that, the, that are embarrassing to the peoples being criticised. It's not surprising that people are reluctant to talk about such things, or even to be conscious that such things happen. Such negative truths tend to be suppressed from a nation's collective memory. People just don't want to think about such things. The Glow Media will force everyone to be much better informed as to what happened in history, warts and all, that is, presenting the negative truths along with the positive truths. Once a global language develops strongly, and nearly everyone on the planet can understand it and use it, then we will see a revolution in terms of global historical awareness. With an internet a billion times more powerful than at the time of writing, that was 2007, Anyone, anywhere, will be able to present material to the world and have it read by anyone who is interested. Of course, with such a ton of information, how does one find material that one is interested in? Uh, Ed Levine, uh, YouTube is pretty well 
got to that stage. Unfortunately, just recently, it started it's in uh, 2016, 2017, it started to censor the stupid fucks. So they, they will kill themselves that way. They'll commit suicide because uh, people are accustomed to lack of censorship, freedom of speech on the internet and they will demand it and if YouTube doesn't give it well there will be other platforms that will and they will take YouTube's business and business and YouTube will go bankrupt idiots back to the book here's where artificial intelligence research can play a major role by being able to scan the world's documents videos etc and select appropriate answers won't it be nice when we can talk to our computers with such questions as Tell me about what happened in the Opium Wars. Give me a five-minute lecture. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, at living. We're not there yet. But uh, if, if if I typed in on Google in 2017, ten years later after this book was written, tell me about what happened in the Opium Wars, it would give me a pretty pretty good summary. So we're getting there. But uh, give me a five-minute lecture. Not yet. Might be interesting to see where we are ten years from now in 2027. Imagine the home computers of the future being able to obtain experience of the IQ levels and intellectual interests of the individuals posing the questions so that they can adapt the presentation of the material appropriately. Once access to global knowledge is truly global and presented in a global language, it will be much easier to create a global culture, one that is largely culturally homogeneous, a precondition for the creation of a truly global state, a basic assumption that appears many times in this book negative consequences h introduction the creation of a global state will not be all sweetness and light there will be some disadvantages as well this subchapter introduces some ideas on where the creation of a global state will probably have negative effects i culture side the term culture side means the killing off of a culture that is a whole culture whereby every single member of that culture dies so that the culture itself becomes only a historical memory. It's a process that has been going on for many decades in the past and will continue well into the future. Cultural anthropologists, the people who study the beliefs and practices of exotic cultures, claim that at the time of writing there are approximately 5,000 to 10,000 cultures on the planet, depending on your definition of what a culture is. They also claim that the smallest of these cultures are dying off at an alarming rate. For example, take some tiny island dwelling culture that has only a few dozen members still living and consider its fate. Its younger generation is leaving the island to make more money elsewhere, where they adopt the superior modern values and ways of the much bigger culture that they work and live in. These younger people then lose fluency in the language of their parents and may even totally reject their parents' lifestyle. People complain about the problem of biodiversity, that is the fact that due to the increase in the size of the global human population and deforestation, etc., that thousands of plant, animal and insect species are dying out every year. Biologists consider this a tragedy. But what about the dying out of human cultures? What about the problem of cultural diversity? As the world continues to shrink, and cultures large and small merge into each other, it's inevitable that the smaller, less dynamic, less creative cultures will not survive the competition posed by the larger cultures. They will not be able to compete with the more attractive features of the larger, more dynamic cultures. They will simply die out. Probably most readers thinking of this for the first time will not be too surprised at such a phenomenon. But how many readers will be surprised if I say that the same fate also awaits the world's major cultures? For example, if I were to say, American culture will die out, French culture will die out, Japanese culture will die out, so too will Chinese culture, Indian culture, etc. Would this not be surprising? To understand the reasoning behind such statements, that is, that the world's major cultures will die out, consider the following. Take some people of a major culture X, for example, the US, France, China, etc., and compare the contents of those people's minds, that is, their ideas, knowledge, values, etc., with those of their great-grandchildren's, who will have grown up in a global culture. Ask yourself, what percentage of the ideas and values in the heads of the great-grandchildren are in common with those of their great-grandparents after the great 
grandchildren have lived in a global culture all their lives. We can quantify this with some basic assumptions. Let us assume, unrealistically, that any culture contributes ideas and behaviours to the world culture in proportion to the size of their population. Then in a global culture, the Globans will be thinking mostly Chinese and Indian thoughts, since these two cultures alone constitute 40% of the world's population, that is, each has over a billion people. Using this argument, consider the French a world-class culture by the standards of the time of writing. The French population is only about 60 million people, that is only 1% of the world's population. So by the above argument, future French citizens will be having only 1% of their thoughts that are of French origin, which implies that the other 99% of their thoughts will be non-French. In other words, those French grand great-grandchildren are no longer French. They will have had their minds almost totally globally colonized. Since virtually all French great-grandchildren will be like this, we can say that effectively traditional French culture has died. A similar argument will hold for the Japanese. Japan has a population roughly double that of the French, so Japanese great-grandchildren will be having only 2% of their thoughts that are of Japanese origin. One comes to the same conclusion that Japanese culture as we know it at the time of writing, that is, one that is essentially monocultured, will die out. From Chinese or Indian culture will be largely overwhelmed. Even Chinese or Indian culture will be largely overwhelmed by global culture, despite the huge populations of China and India. Non-Chinese or non-Indian thoughts, ideas, etc., will be outnumbered four to one in the minds of the Chinese or Indian great-grandchildren. Again, we come to a similar conclusion, but not as force forcefully as before. Nevertheless, Chinese and Indian culture will largely die out. Now let us make a more realistic assumption about the assumptions, the contributions to world culture from the monocultures that exist at the time of writing. In the 19th century, it was Europe that dominated the world, intellectually, culturally, economically, etc. If a glow media could hypothetically have come into existence magically at that time, then the world would have been largely Europeanized due to the general attractiveness of European ideas, technologies, values, etc. So instead of assuming that the percentage of ideas existing in a global culture that come from a given culture is directly proportional to the size of the population of that culture, for example, India's contribution would be about 20%, China's 20%, we have to in include a second factor into these percentages, and that is the critical concept of global attractiveness of a given culture. An obvious example of that idea that has massive global attractiveness is that of democracy. This European concept spread to the US by British colonizers who had been influenced by such European philosophers as the Brit, John Locke, and the Frenchman, Henri Rousseau. At the time of writing, there are some 120 plus countries, now about 130, in the world that are democracies. At the rate things are progressing, there will be no more dictatorships left in the world within about 40 years. See figure one in chapter three. Obviously, the idea of democracy is one that has universal appeal, as shown by the fact that the whole planet has already become democratic, or soon will be. Another idea with global appeal is that of material wealth, as created by modern technology, which is derived in turn from applying the concepts of modern science. All countries at the time of writing are pushing their citizens to learn modern science, so as to benefit from the material gains flowing from modern technologies. Admittedly, some cultures do this less aggressively than others and are a lot poorer as a result. The Arab countries are thought to be poorer because they place more emphasis on rote learning of traditional religious texts than on learning modern science and hence fall further and further behind the more science-based cultures in both economic and material terms. There are many other popular ideas that are spreading globally. For example, the concept of individual liberties, such as choosing one's own marriage partner or sexual partner, the use of contraception, freedom to believe what one wants, etc. With the rise of Glow Media, there will be sustained planet-wide competition in the minds of billions of people of the various ideas and values from many cultures. Only the most popular ideas will survive this competition, implying that most of them will lose and will and will lose, more or less, and will thus, more or less, die out. People will have their values and intellectual horizons extended. They will be exposed to the ideas of a whole, of the, of a whole planet, not just those of a single monoculture. This global mix of ideas will be hugely larger than what a single monocultured media can provide at the time of writing. 
Only the most popular ideas will survive this competition when cultural values clash. Young people who have to be acculturated anyway will have open minds to these clashes and will choose what they prefer by individual choice. They will not be limited the way their parents or grandparents were in being exposed only to a monocultured media. They will be exposed to the ideas of a whole planet so can pick and choose from a far greater variety of alternatives. The probability then of choosing their own monoculture set of ideas is lowered and hence their minds become more multi as a result. But despite the advantages of cultural homogenization, will not millions if not billions of people, especially the older generations, who have for most of their lives been strongly attached to their monocultured values, feel alienated and unfamiliar with the new global culture? Will the older generation resent seeing the monoculture of their childhood destroyed, washed away in a torrent of globification? Is it then probable that we shall see a wave of mass alienation on the part of the older generation as they witness the destruction of their social norms and values of their own childhood socialization? Question mark. I think so, probably. There will be a backlash to some degree, but even the older generation will not be immune to the powerfully seductive influence of the global media. They too will be sucked in, fascinated by what other cultures are thinking and doing. They too will be influenced. Natural curiosity in anyone will ensure that no mind will, be, will remain totally immune from Glow Media's influence. But despite the above, many people will regret the passing of the monocultures and feel nostalgia for a simpler, less ideologically and intellectually competitive lifestyle in which one did not have one's mind constantly bombarded by alternative ways of thinking and behaving. Choices, choices, too many choices! Uh, I'm running out of time, I'll stop here. Next section is J, Global Boredom. Ciao.